of the Old School Primitive Baptist. This is Elder D. Martin, Sr. Stay tuned for another gospel message of God's free and sovereign grace. You know, Brother Mike had uh, provoked my thinking on a number of things while he was speaking. And uh, one of them was about... uh, it is as is as we have been on a train that has gone off the track, and if we had gone off the track abruptly and we had run off the rail and just had a total uh, wreck of destruction, it would have been very obvious and known and even felt by those who were on the train. When a train begins to go down a way on, on a track, on a gradual course, deviating from the way that it was determined to go initially and this branches off and heads off to the other direction, it's a gradual thing and you don't really experience it until you get to a place to where you say, as Brother Mike said, and you look around and say, wow, what am I doing out in the middle of this cornfield? <clears throat> now you know me well enough to know that I am not a, 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 a preacher who tries to influence and to impress people by telling them what that I feel that they would like to hear or want to hear. I know what most people that make up society want to hear. Uh, Brother Mike had made mention about what people like to hear. It's the cowboy church situation. I've heard about it. I know about it. I've read some stuff about it. I know some people involved in over around uh, Brooksville area and places where they have a cowboy church. People come there and they dress, they, they dress uh, in, in just regular jeans and, cow, and long sleeve western shirts and cowboy hats and, and uh, cowboy boots. Some of them wear spurs. I mean, they really do the whole gamut, you know. And then this is just what they identify with. And then there's the bikers for, for Christ. Uh, in, in up in my uh, community, there was a, the First Baptist Church had a thing because they have a chapter there. Bikers for Christ. There's about... Uh, maybe a dozen fellows there out of the congregation of uh, two or three hundred that uh, ride motorcycles, and therefore they have a chapter, Bikers for Christ, there. And they wear these uh, these denim, uh, cut-off, uh, little vests, and on the back is this big embroidered emblem, Bikers for Jesus, and it has a scripture underneath of it indicating that, that we are a witness of Christ, and we are bikers for the cause of the Lord. And, and, and like Brother Mike said, this is all, uh, it is all geared towards a particular group of people that have an interest in a worldly hobby or thing uh, to try to get them by this influential means and methods to get involved in the church and, and the end result is that hoping that they can be persuaded to believe on Jesus. Now that's, that's the end result. And it, it is the end result of most evangelical churches today, and I'm not talking about just the Baptists, but I'm talking about all evangelicals that are out there trying to persuade people and to build the kingdom of God up here on earth in this time realm by the means of the preaching and the influence of individuals to others as you try to get them and persuade them to believe on Christ, is that 
they do all and anything they can do to get them to come to get under the sound of the gospel. They go out, they'll knock on doors, give out pamphlets that I have taken and in times past been involved. God forbid and God forgive me for, for saying that if you come to Sunday school, young man, this coming Sunday, we'll pick you up on our bus, we'll give you a little beast boy with a goldfish in it to take home. And, uh, and then there's those that... Uh, that are on the bus ministries, that are the bus captains, and those that work uh, with uh, uh, getting the children safely on and off the buses and to the Sunday school uh, buildings and so forth, that at the end of the Sunday evening service, they have a, a prize giveaway for the awards of those who brought the most in on their buses. It's all a numbers game to get people to come to church that they might be persuaded to become a Christian. God never had authorized and endorsed that means and method in the Holy Writ to build His kingdom church. He never authorized that. He never said go out there and bring them in and, 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 and get them under the sound and, 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 and tell them about they have an opportunity. To, to choose this one called Jesus. And that, that, that it's up to their decision to make this commitment and to become an heir of God and have eternal life. You want me to tell you where the church of Jesus Christ, as we see it in society, has gone away? It has turned into a soul-saving mill instead of a sheep-feeding place and habitation of God's people. Now, I'm telling you the truth this morning. And I can back it up by the Word of God. The, the Bible indicates that God's church is made up of those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And those individuals are those which are the church of Christ, as the local called out uh, group of believers that are brought together to meet and to worship God. Now, let me ask you a question. When you bring in a multitude and a majority of folks that have been influenced to come because of your kind invitation or a gift or some kind of, of carnal persuasion, what do you have in that church building when it comes time for Sunday worship? You have a majority of unsaved, unredeemed, unregenerate people that have come there uh, uh, looking uh, to kind of fulfill their little religious inkling. But they cannot worship God of whom they do not know. They cannot sing out of the songbook the songs of adoration and glory to God of whom they do not know. They merely move their mouth and make a sound with their lips but they can't worship God. So what's happened is, it is just like uh, Jeremiah proclaimed and Isaiah proclaimed when Israel uh, had taken and was polluted by those outside of the twelve tribes of Israel. God said, do not, do not infiltrate and bring in among you those outside the twelve tribes. For when you do, it shall be an abomination unto you, and, and, it, it, and it, is, uh, it is not pleasing in my sight. And lo and behold, Solomon did exactly what God told him not to do. He had 700 wives, and they were, uh, I, I can't even <coughs> count them, I'd have to read them, but they were uh, probably at least 12 to 15 nationalities. They were black, they were, they were mixed breeds, they were different, they were the Canaanites and Shiites and Moabites and, and women of, of, uh, uh, of such uh, beautiful and fair in the sight of Solomon that he could not uh, avoid the temptation of taking them among him in his kingdom and becoming uh, intimate with them. And what did they bring with them? All of these Canaanites, Moabites, and the Shiites, and all the other ites, 
of the pagan world and realm of nations around about, they brought in with them their pagan gods that began to influence Solomon, and he even began to build shrines to their pagan gods. And God was bitterly upset with Solomon, and God began to withdraw his grace and loving mercy upon Solomon, and Solomon in time's spirit was vexed within him uh, over what he had done. Let me tell you something. In regarding what Michael had said about the train, uh, when did it go off of the track? It went off so gradual we didn't know it. Let me tell you something. I believe, by my observations in the, in the 67 years that I have been alive in this country, in this society, that around in World War II, when they started putting married women to work in the military factories, is when a lot of the problems began in this country. Because that's when men and women who were married worked in the factories and labored to make military machinery and the temptations of them to be looking upon one another in a way that they wasn't being satisfied by in their own marriage situations began to be a temptation that was never there before. And things began to turn. Morality began to turn into immorality during that particular time was a great turning point. And I see... I see as a vision in my mind as a as bright spotlight of God's grace across this nation from the days of the Great Awakening when men would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached and would weep over their sinful state, fall upon their knees out in a wilderness field by the preaching of one like as George Whitfield in South Georgia, and throughout the region where he preached, you could hear his voice for three and four miles. It has been recorded in history. He would preach with such fervent zeal and with such vocal ability that men would hear him and come to hear who it was who was speaking. And he preached with such authority in the Holy Spirit of God that men fell on their knees and cried out to God for forgiveness, that they might find peace for their soul. And there was a revival that moved across the land. And in New England, the Great Awakening time, uh, when there was others uh, that was preaching the gospel, and men and women in meetings came and flocked in to tabernacles built by the hands of men that would hold uh, three and 4,000 people. And they would cry out to God for salvation and for help and hope because of the preaching of the gospel. And this was before all this invitation system was even brought about as a means of men. This was just merely preaching the gospel of Christ and the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus, caused men to weep of their unworthiness before God. And then what happened? This bright light of grace as it shone down upon the land of the United States of America and as things begin to materialize in God's sovereign purpose, who has determined all things that come to pass, it begins to change the things and the morality of our society. To where uh, in 1850, it was not known of any primitive Baptist churches as far as some of the corresponding uh, minutes from some of the major and largest associations of primitive Baptists in the United States had ever recorded in their history records there was not an account of divorce among any of the churches in 1850. Not one. 1850, 1950, 2011, here we are, and madness is rampant everywhere. What happened? The train, it definitely went off the track. And the brightness of the grace of God's light, its beam be, it began to move across the nation. And as it did, uh, the grace as it was withdrawn left an immortal people behind to, to, to live and to, uh, to fall away from the God 
of which our nation stood for by a majority at one time. I say a majority, I think there was a majority of folks who would give uh, a lip service uh, co a conversation to a belief in Christ in the 1850s. And in that era, do you realize, you talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ and his unconditional election among uh, those of his, uh, his church people. Do you know that 78% of the denominations in the United States of America in 1800 believed and preached in a God of absolute predestination and believed it in a God that was absolutely sovereignty and sovereign in all ways? And yet today we have a handful of people and it's, it's, it's mainly among the Baptists. And of course, the primitive Baptists adhere to that doctrine of, of God's uh, free and sovereign grace. But yet it, it is of the old line of predestinarians of which we call ourselves that adhere to the predestination of all things which come to pass. And the rest of them have departed from that truth because it is not... Uh, likable to the natural mind and man, as Brother Mike had preached. It is camouflaged from those who have no understanding of it, whose eyes are blinded to the truth. But to them who have been revealed the truth of the matter, they love that doctrine because that's where their hope is really grounded at. If God has not determined us to be his children, let me tell you, dear brothers and sisters, there's no possible way we, we could ever be the children of God, apart from his divine, predestined election of grace, calling us out of a life of sin and woe. Yes, the train began to run off the track years ago in the 40s, and it began to run off the track, and society began to wax worse and worse. And then it began to swing from the 40s and the 50s and 60s, and then comes the big, all this big... Uh, uh, Sunday school uh, campaignism stuff that was never never done before, but all of a sudden now man comes up with ideas. We got new ways to get people in, uh, saved. We're going to get them in the church by 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 enticing them with things, and we're still doing it today. They're doing it by the thousands all around the country. But again, what I'm telling you is what they are getting in there as far as individuals or people who are not able to worship the Lord God Almighty because they have not been born again of the Spirit of God. They have been enticed to be religious people because they have made a decision to follow Jesus. But Jesus Christ has not decided for them. You say, how, how can I say such a thing? Because the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And in that new creature, there is a fruit of the Spirit, which makes up of things such as the characteristics of joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, <laughs> kindness, love and faith, and all these other things. This is all the fruit of the Spirit. That is, in every one is born of the Spirit. And when you go to a church and you see people and talk to people, uh, and they talk the religious game on Sunday, and the rest of the week they live like the devil, they are totally deceived and are nothing but a bunch of carnal religionists that have no way of ever standing before God and being justified in a state like that. That everyone that God has determined to call, who he has determined to, to, to call out of this time world, by his darling son, Jesus Christ, and by the wooing of the Holy Spirit, and, and by the new birth that must be taking place within the heart and mind of an individual, can only one come to know and understand what it is to be a child of God. <clears throat> I didn't start, at least I didn't think I, I was going to start there, but Mike provoked me into this train thing. I'm going to say one more thing, and then I'm going to go into Scripture, and then I'm going to try to shorten it up as much as possible, because time. Is that we're living in a society today to where there is more single parents and mostly mothers raising children without direction because the mother has to work to try to maintain some financial stability and provide for the children. 
whether it's a child, three or four, or how many. If that's not the case, then grandmothers are raising grandchildren, not mothers. It's a sad thing when our society, you know, when I went to junior high school in St. Petersburg, uh, I remember back in 1960, uh, they used to be kind of a joke. And uh, because uh, the junior high that I went to was on the southern part of town, near Blacktown, uh, it used to be kind of a joke that uh, uh, one of the most confused days of the year was Father's Day in, uh, in Blacktown. <laughs> that was a joke. It ain't a joke no longer. It's one of the most confusing days in the white society as well now. Who's your daddy? Oh, I don't know. Where's your mama? I don't know. Are we are we hoodwinked and blind as to why we have children that don't have any direction, that don't have any moral upbringing, that don't have any teaching as to what is right and what is wrong? Is it because we don't have nobody around to lead them and direct them? They're left to themselves. Is there any wonder why that they... They come from, from uh, areas uh, and go into a convenience store with guns and bandanas and, and rob a place for $30 cash and then shoot the clerk and kill them and have no remorse or conscience about it. They don't care. They, they have been brought up to not care. Why? Mom hadn't cared for me. Dad didn't care because I don't know who he is. And Grandma, she's getting so old that she's so sick that she can't do nothing. And so here I am left to myself. And we have a society full of kids. It ain't blacks only. It ain't Hispanics only. It's black and white and red and yellow. It's everywhere. It is as if that grace of God's light beam that shined brightly in the great awakening and across the preaching of Whitfield and the other religion... Uh, Pictures of the gospel that God used to to uh, minister the truth of the grace of God has has just slowly moved across the continent and is with being withdrawn faster and faster. To where our society has become an apostate place, to where you cannot hardly go into what's called a church house and hear a sound gospel message from the Word of God. And I say that from experience that in my own community where there is uh, denominations uh, of uh, whether it's a Methodist or whether it's, a, it's a, a Baptist church or whatever it is, you go there, you have a big screen TV sitting there and they will flash on their praise and worship songs which you've never heard of in your life. You don't know the words. They don't use hymn books no more. They merely just sing from watching the screen. And then it's repetitious courses one after another to where you just feel like you're exhausted the time you get done singing. And then the minister gets up and talks about all the programs that they're going to have through the week and where do you fit in to help out uh, working for Jesus. And then he may take and, and have a sermonette for about 15 minutes and then always conclude it with now it's up to you. You know, Jesus loves you. And now it's up to you to come and decide for him and serve him. And this is a place where you can come and have a home and get busy for Jesus. Isn't this a sad situation? This is where uh, we have come in a society. And, and why, why is it that the primitive Baptist and of the predestined and primitive Baptists, that they are appearing to become extinct. I'll tell you why. Because God, God is taking and winding things down to where uh, there is a remnant, as, as Brother Mike said, and, and as Paul writes in there, there is a remnant according to the election of God, who are only going to be able to hear the truth of the of the matter and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and worship him in spirit and in truth. And the rest are just multitudes of religionists. 
that have been told that here is the way to life eternal, just make a decision. When the bottom line is, as Christ decided for you, has he chosen you? Has he elected you? Is, has he called you? Because the Bible says that my sheep, Jesus said, John chapter 10, hear my voice and they shall follow me. They follow me. Not another shepherd shall they follow. For so they'll, not, they'll not follow a hiring, one who's been hired to tend the sheep. But they're going to follow the good shepherd. Because you know why? They know his voice. And it is, it is a necessity that you know the voice of the good shepherd. And that you have followed him because he has called you to do so. For without that holy calling, and without him causing you to come and believe upon him, of whom God the Father has sent to redeem his people from their sin, there is no hope of salvation. And that's the truth of the matter. We have fallen off the tracks, and religion is going down the wrong way in a means and manner of apostasy. According to what Paul said, that in the latter days there shall become, have come upon you a great apostasy. It will be perilous times. And we're living in them now. We're seeing it more and more. Every day you look on the news, it's a new dilemma. Here it was, Iraq. What? Three or four, four or five years ago? Or we can go back to Desert Storm. That's been 10, 12 years ago. Then we, we come up further. Then we go over here now, Afghanistan. Now Libya. And I may tell you what. When Saudi Arabia begins to rebel against the kingship of the rule over there. And their oil supplies begin to be hindered from being transported out of that country to around the world. Five dollars at the pump will just be pennies out of your pocket. It'll be seven to ten dollars a gallon. And I'm telling you right now that they have got us around the throat and this nation's government is uh, just as much a fault as, as anybody. And we have let them put get us in a place to where it's going to put a strain on everything that in this country is going on. You think about it now. Just think about just one thing. That if fuel gets so expensive that everything that is transported by truck or train, mostly truck, has to be gone, uh, lifted up by at least 25 or more percent uh, to pay for the transportation cost, how much that's going to cost your household. And you just think about that when things get so bad that they cannot fill the grocery shelves of your local grocery store because of cost and transportation and other things of the economic uh, dilemma that's coming about our nation, what it's going to be like. We have been so used to, as a people, to go and get what we want when we want it at any time we need it. I'm telling you, friends, I'm not a prophet nor the son of one. Those times are going to be shortly coming to an end. So take heed and be ready. And look unto Jesus, who said, I shall supply all your need according to, to the riches in glory by himself, Christ Jesus. God said, I'll never leave you desolate. He said, I'll never forsake you either. We have that blessed hope to those that be Christ. That he shall protect us and he shall provide all that we need. Not what we want. See, we have been able to provide pretty much what we want. But God promises he'll provide what we need. And sisters and brothers, that's a big difference. And we have yet to learn, I think, that lesson. May God be with us. May God help us. May God be uh, our help and our hope in the time of need is my prayer. Why don't you pray with me? Father, my God, in Jesus' wonderful name, I thank you for the privilege that you've given us, Lord, this day together. To sing the songs of faith. 
to sing those words of hope, those words of salvation, the words that adore uh, He who has given Himself for us, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, dear God, that what has been spoken here this day may find place in the hearts and minds of Thy people. May we be encouraged, Lord, that no matter how times uh, get rough in the future and how bad things may be, yet we do have that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine and, and oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. For as we go through this temporal realm called life, and Lord, one day we'll take on immortality and it shall be no more a struggle down here below. Help us, O oh God, and bless us in the days ahead is my humble prayer. In Christ's blessed name, amen.